2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, falling away to the Antichrist. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked, or the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now Paul here is outlining two frightful things that will strike the church just prior to the Lord's coming. Number one, a great falling away, a great apostasy in the church. Secondly, a spirit of Antichrist possessing many who are in the church. Now folks, for years we've been preaching and teaching about the coming Antichrist. He's going to come one day and he's going to be well received and I'll tell you why he's going to be well received. He's going to be well received even by many who were Christians who have been prepared for his coming and he's going to be revealed and the only reason he's not revealed now it's not his time and the Holy Ghost is holding it back. But one day the Holy Ghost will lift his restraining hand. This man will be revealed. He'll be incarnated by Satan. He will demand and receive the worship of mankind. And then when his work is finished, his time is done, the Bible said he's going to be consumed with the mouth of our holy God. But there is an antichrist spirit. Just as surely as the spirit of Jesus Christ abides in us. The scripture said, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Antichrist has a spirit. There is a spirit of Antichrist that is even now moving in the world, preparing for the coming of this man. Just as sure as you as a believer have the spirit of Christ in you, there are people today that are absolutely possessed of the spirit of Antichrist. Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity did already work. It's already at work. The spirit of Antichrist, Paul said, is already at work. He's already moving. He's already taking position. He's already coming into power. We know the Antichrist is in full control of the secular media. All secular television, theater, all the networks, all the printed material, all now are under the control of the spirit of Antichrist. What, who but Antichrist could so bias the American press and so bias the editors and the writers and the actors so that abortion is called a right rather than a sin? Who but Antichrist could mock everything that's sacred and holy and worshipped in filthy movies and wicked vile programs on television? The Antichrist is producing MTV. Literally, the Antichrist spirit is in full control of Fox television. I, I read, I don't watch that stuff but, uh, because I don't have television, but MTV, from what I read, and Fox television, in a newspaper, you just look at some of the reviews and some of the absolute filth. Who but the Antichrist? Who but the spirit of Antichrist could be behind it? And folks, he's getting bolder and bolder. Our society is on the brink of becoming a raging hell. I am totally convinced now, more than ever, that cable television, filthy movies, both in the theater and the home VCRs, is the number one cause, is going to be the number one cause of hearts being prepared for the Antichrist. The number one because the eye is the gate to the heart. And he's gonna march right through the eye and take control and sit on the throne of the heart because of filthy, corrupted, jaded eyes. Who oh, but Antichrist can tell people they can drink from two cups, the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. First Corinthians 10. 
But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of devils. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table in the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, folks, I, I have a pastor friend who just delights to get up and tell his congregation, if, if you are really mature in Christ, you can handle all of this stuff. He's talking about movies. He's talking about television. Talking, if you're mature, you can handle it. No, folks, it's not a matter of handling it. It's a matter that you can't have fellowship with devils. It's a matter you can't drink out of two cups. You drink the Lord's cup or the devil's cup. You can't sip out of both sides. You know what it is? It's called a sacrifice to the devil. That's what God calls it, a sacrifice to demons. God help us. Now, before I close, I'm going to give you the good part. Hallelujah. Go back to 2 Thessalonians. They're going to be just a precious body, Paul says, who are going to rise up against the spirit of Antichrist and they are going to stand strong. They will never be overcome. They're going to overcome the world, the flesh, the devil. They're going to overcome the wicked one, the Bible says. Hallelujah. Verse 13, 2 Thessalonians, 2nd chapter. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Here's that special people. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Oh, look, look at for just a minute. I really believe that this church, the great majority that are sitting here this morning, you're here because you love the truth. You're not afraid to be reproved. And because of that, God sanctifies your spirit. He sanctifies your mind. He convicts you when you've done wrong so that you don't run out there saying, oh, everything is all right. But you examine your heart before the Holy Ghost. The Word, a sharp two-edged sword, pierces and it heals you. Hallelujah. Wherefore, He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand firm or fast and hold the traditions which have been taught by word of our epistle or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us, given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Hallelujah. Folks, keep your heart open to the word. Love the word of God. God will establish you. When that Antichrist spirit comes in like a flood, the word of God lifts up a standard against it, cannot make an inroad to you. The more wicked this world becomes, the more righteous you will become in the name of the Lord. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. Oh, let the devil rage. Let the Antichrist spirit come. You won't be moved because you're on the word of God. Hallelujah. Verse 2, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. And listen to this. For the rod of the wicked, that's the rod of the Antichrist, the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Look at me. He's got a rod. That means authority. But his authority and his power and his reign will not come upon the righteous. Shall not rest upon you. But God said, I'll give you power and authority. You will not be overcome by Satan. You will overcome the world. And I look at the whole religious scene today and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful, acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish, deep, 
pain, in sorrow, agony of God's heart. We've held on to our religious rhetoric and our revival talk, but we've become so passive. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. You search the scripture and you'll find that when God determined to recover a ruined situation, he would share his own anguish for what God saw happening to his church and to his people. And he would find a praying man and he would take that man and literally baptize him in anguish. You find it in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is in ruins. How is God going to deal with this? How is God going to restore the ruin? Now folks, look at me. Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was a career man. But this was a praying man. And God found a man who would not just have a flash of emotion, not just some great sudden burst of concern and then let it die. He said, no, I broke down and I wept and I mourned and I fasted. And then I began to pray night and day. Why didn't these other men, why didn't they have an answer? Why didn't God use them in restoration? Why didn't they have a word? Because there was no sign of anguish. No weeping, not a word of prayer. It's all ruin. Does it matter to you today? Does it matter to you at all that God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world? That there's such a coldness sweeping the land Closer than that, does it matter about the Jerusalem that's in our own hearts? The sign of ruin that's slowly draining spiritual power and passion, blind to lukewarmness, blind to the mixture that's creeping in. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Uh, let me ask you, is, is what I just said convicted you at all? There's a great difference between anguish and concern. Concern is something that you, that begins to interest you. You take an interest in a project or a cause or a concern or a need. I'm going to tell you something I've learned over all my years, 50 years of preaching. If it is not born in anguish, if it has not been born by the Holy Spirit, where when you saw and heard of the ruin, it drove you to your knees. And all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish, a place where lifetime decisions are made. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing his heart with you. You see, you, you, you either walk away and go back to your passivity and say, I'm just going to be an ordinary Christian and there's no such thing. or. Your heart begins to cry out, Oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness and something has to be done. You can't go unchallenged. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me, don't tell me you're concerned. Don't tell me that you want your unsaved loved ones saved when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Come on. Lord, there's some need to get this altar and confess. I am not what I was. I am not where I'm supposed to be. God, I don't have your heart or your burden. I've been, I wanted it easy. Just want to be happy. But Lord, true joy comes. 
true joy comes out of anguish. There's nothing of the flesh will give you joy. I don't care how much money, I don't care what kind of new house there is, absolutely nothing physical can give you joy. It's only what is accomplished by the Holy Spirit when you obey Him and take on His heart. Build the walls around your family. Build the walls around your own heart. Make you strong and impregnable against the enemy. Now, the purpose of my message tonight is to help us understand why the righteous suffer. Now, I'm, this, this message is going to make some of you angry. Because you're into a doctrine now that teaches that if you've got a certain quality or quantity of faith, you don't have to suffer. And I'm not mad at you, I'm mad at that damnable doctrine. You can be very, very sure tonight that God has a purpose behind everything you and I suffer. God has a purpose. First of all, let me get right into it. First of all, we should not be surprised when we suffer. The Bible has warned us in advance that the godly in Christ will suffer. The Bible is full of it. The New Testament is full of it. There is a Holy Ghost school of sympathy and it consists of tested saints who have suffered greatly. These are saints of God who have been tested and they've been tossed to and fro. They've been tempted and tried and mistreated. The Bible in fact speaks in Philippians 3.10 of a fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus founded this school by the way. He set it up, the whole curriculum, he established it because he was the one who suffered the most. Jesus suffered mentally, physically, with anguish. He was rejected, he was distrusted, he was abused, he was mocked, he was laughed at. He knew what it was to be lonely, hungry, poor, unloved, shamed, he was slandered. He was called a liar, a fraud, a false prophet. He was humiliated. His own family misunderstood him. His own mother had to ponder things in her heart about him. His most trusted friends lost faith in him when he spoke of his own his power of resurrection. His own disciples forsook him and fled when, they need when he needed them the most. One of them betrayed him. Another denied that he even knew him. And finally they spat upon him, they mocked him, and they murdered him. And the scripture said, God announced beforehand by the mouth of all his prophets that his Christ should suffer. He would be a suffering savior. And Jesus sympathizes with all of our hurts and sufferings because he went through it all himself. The scripture says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but who has been tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. We have a Savior, the Bible says, that can sympathize with anything we go through because he's been there. The Paul, you know, if you know anything about his life, lived his entire life through suffering. No man outside of Christ has suffered like Paul the Apostle. And the word of his suffering spread all through the church like wildfire. The Judaizing Christians and the Judaizing teachers, they just jumped on that. What they were saying, if Paul's gospel is true, it, 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 see, he doesn't believe in circumcision, and that proves that God's not with him because he's suffering. You don't believe Paul's doctrine because you look at his life, he's suffering. If God was really with him, if Jesus was really with him, he wouldn't be suffering. He wouldn't be thrown in jail, he wouldn't be shipwrecked. Well, I've, heard, I've heard evangelists, uh, prosperity evangelists, this past few years saying the same thing. If Paul had faith like we have it today, as the revelation we have, he'd never been in jail, he'd have never suffered. Now I call that blasphemy. I call it outright blasphemy. He, he, he knew the Judaizing teachers were going around saying, Look at Paul, don't believe his message because he's a man of pain, he's a man of suffering. God can't be with him. So Paul sent Timothy to the church at Thessalonica with a message. And this is the message that Timothy delivered. He said, Let no man be, be disturbed by these afflictions. Now Paul was, had just, he'd been stoned, he had been thrown out of two cities now. They had maligned him, they'd mocked him, they called him all kinds of names. He was being run out of town. He was, he was being uh, mistreated on all sides and the word spread everywhere. Look how they're treating Paul. Paul says, let no man be disturbed by these afflictions, his own afflictions in other words. For you yourself know that we have been destined to this. We have been destined to suffer. It, uh, you can prove that if you don't want to believe what I'm telling you. You can mark down 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. 
John 16, 33, Jesus said, In the world ye shall have tribulation. And that word tribulation that Jesus used in Greek is flippus. Flippus, which means anguish, burdens, persecutions, and trouble. The Lord said, in this world you're going to have anguish, burdens, persecution, you're going to have trouble. Jesus also forewarned that in the last days there would be great troubles fall upon all God's people. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. And that's the same word, they'll deliver you to burdens and persecution and troubles. And they will kill you and you will be hated of all nations on account of my name. And those of us who are preaching, they call us, they call us gloom, doom preachers. Make fun. Paul went about warning believers that they would experience deep personal sufferings. Now you will sit here tonight and you're experiencing deep personal suffering. Hear what Paul said. I'm reading from Acts 14. Don't turn to Acts 14, 22. Paul went about confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, now listen to this, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And secondly, the purpose of suffering is to produce comforters to the body of Christ. To produce comforters to the body of Christ. There's a school of sympathizers who've been tested in the fire that come out proving God is faithful. First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 3, beginning. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, faith, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, saying Greek word, which means trouble and anguish, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of all our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. In other words, the Lord is saying, I took you through this trial so that you could come forth as a testimony of my faithfulness. You could stand before anyone else who's going through the same thing that you went through. And you could say, hold on brother, hold on sister, I've been there, God's faithful. Some that are hearing me right now are enduring such great sufferings because you're being chastened by the Lord. The, the, the Lord sees that there's a heart that needs to be broken. He sees a will that needs to be broken. And I want to tell you, if He's chastening you right now, He's doing it in love. Because whom the Father loves, He chastens. If you're under the chastening rod of the Lord, it's nothing to fear unless you have a stubborn nature. But if you're being chastened by the Lord, the scripture said it's for your profit and it will afterward produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness if you're trained by it. But if you allow a root of bitterness to spring up, it's going to destroy you and defy you, the scripture says. Alright, now I'm going to try to wrap it up and get right down to the what we call the bottom line here. Get rid of every thought of quitting. I just hit a nerve. Quitting. Bring into every captivity every thought of easing off on your total obedience to the Lord. Now listen to me. Here, you, if you don't get this, you won't understand anything I've said tonight. It's not affliction or suffering of itself that teaches us. Because I know many people, many good Christians, who have been destroyed by their sufferings. They have been blown away by it. Do you know anybody like that? They gave up, they said, I don't understand it. They see godly people suffer and they've just given up. They quit on the Lord. They say it doesn't work and they quit. No, the only way you're trained by suffering, the only way it can work out the fruit of righteousness in you and in me, it is not suffering, but it's suffering understood. 
It is affliction that is accepted and not rejected because the hand of God has permitted it and he's done it for a purpose. By the way, let me give you a good argument for the devil. Next time the devil or any imps of hell come at you and try to accuse you uh, of God being mad at you, or you're suffering. Now, there are people who suffer from sin. I, there, that's a whole other message. Some of you under the chastisement of the Lord. Yes, but he does that in love to his children. But next time, here's what you bring to the devil. First of all, Jesus Christ suffered mightily in the flesh and he was perfect. Didn't he suffer? Tell that to the devil. Paul and all our church fathers suffered great afflictions and God loved them dearly, didn't he? And they all suffered, the scripture says. Instead of sufferings and afflictions being a sign of God's displeasure, it's a sign of sonship. The Bible said, where is there a son of mine that I don't chastise? If I'm not chastising him, he's not a son. Instead of letting the devil tell you it's a sign of God's displeasure, it's a sign of sonship. Every affliction is intended for my spiritual benefit and my growth to equip me to sympathize with others who are in need. It's grievous, it's painful, yes, and I cry out of my hurt, but afterward, if I receive it, if I'm trained by it, it's going to bear fruit. I'm going to become more like Jesus. Tell that to the devil.